Hello, AP Psych Superstars. Can you guys hear me okay tonight? Let me know in the comments if you can hear me or if there's any problems with anything going on. My name is Megan. Um, I work here at Fiveable, and I'll be doing the AP Psychology live sessions with you guys throughout the year. Um, a couple of cool things before we jump into specific AP Psych stuff. Um, you guys can interact with me through the chat, but also um, through the questions and through um, the poll that's posted. I believe Amanda posted a poll for us. She kind of was wondering how many of you belong to Fiveable already. And um, if you want to take a look at that and respond sometime, it'd be great. Um, as for the Ask a Question tab, you can see it kind of on the lower right-ish hand portion of your screen. If any time today you have any questions that come up related to what we're talking about, you can throw your question in the, the queue there and I will get to it before the end of the night. So um, check that out and leave a question there. So um, we are going to talk today a little bit about some of the history and approaches to psychology. So, um, Sorry, before we jump in there, my slides are a little bit off here. I wanted to talk a little bit too about our upcoming psych review session. So after today, we have one next Tuesday about research methods. We're gonna go over the descriptive versus experimental methods, and we'll talk about all the different parts of an experiment, things like that that can be confusing, like independent versus dependent variables, things like that. On September 18th, we'll do statistics, which I'm sure everyone loves so much. And then um, the 25th, we're going to get into the bio unit, which could be a pretty tricky unit for kids sometimes. So um, that was one you probably want to for sure join and kind of get the info about neurons and neurotransmitters and all the kind of inner workings of the brain and things like that. Um, all right. So today's focus is on the intro unit which is his history and approaches to psychology. And so today, um, I'm in Wisconsin. It was actually our very first day of school. And so we just kind of jumped into this. I'm not sure um, if you want to throw in the comments where you guys are at in psychology. That kind of gives me an idea how much you've already covered in school this year as well. Um, but if you haven't started yet, this focus, um, the focus of this unit is really just a really broad introductory field of psychology. It goes through the kind of basic history. Um, it talks about some of the famous psychologists, different career paths in psychology, different ways psychologists think about psychology. It's really um, a really big overview. And so it can seem like there's a lot of information in it, but also in reality, it's an intro. And so it doesn't go super in depth. So hopefully, you're not finding out, um, finding it too hard or too scary. I'm seeing a lot of you are already in the comments saying that you're just starting or your first unit test is coming up. So hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, this unit makes up about 2 to 4% of the AP exam, so that's pretty small. A lot of the other units are about 6 to 8%. So that's another reason to not stress too much today about this unit. It kind of gets us, just gets us starting the year off kind of, dip in our toes in the psychology waters. Um, one thing that I think you guys or kids in general stress a little bit about are the perspectives because there's so many of them. And in this unit, you don't really go super in depth. I would really encourage you to not stress about them because as the year goes on, each one of those perspectives is going to have its own unit. And so you'll learn all about the biological perspective much more in depthly. There's a whole unit about cognition, so don't freak out about it. It'll be, it'll get a lot easier as the year goes on. Um, and so the first kind of content then that I want to jump in, we're going way, way back in history here, is this idea of the nature-nurture debate. And so um, that's really where psychology gets its roots. I wouldn't call what Socrates and Plato do necessarily psychology, but it kind of it, it starts the roots in the process about thinking about human behavior and our knowledge and our thought processes and things like that. And so the whole gist of this nature nurture debate is basically, am I born knowing everything I'm going to know, um, kind of already filled in and already complete? Or am I nurtured 
by my environment, by the people around me. I grow knowledge, I gain knowledge as I go. And so the easiest way I think to kind of keep the beginning kind of roots of our psychology psychologists um, straight in your head would be to kind of do a little T-chart like I have here and put nature on one side, nurture on the other side. And on the nature side, the names that you just have to kind of memorize would be Socrates, Plato, and Descartes. And the big thing is just knowing that they believe that knowledge is innate. We're born with it. We have what we have, and that's all we're going to be in life is what we're born with. And then on the flip side of that are the psychologists who would say, hang on a second, that's not true at all. We've got the nurture side of the debate with Aristotle and Francis Bacon and John Locke. And so those are kind of the names you have to memorize. This unit has just a lot of names thrown at you. And so if you can give those names some context, you're going to have an easier time remembering who goes with what. So I would start with here, the nature, the nurture, make some sort of a chart to, to remember who goes where. And then the big thing that goes with the nurture side of this debate is this idea of a tabula rasa. And so um, John Locke would say that we are a tabula rasa, which is a blank slate. I'm born completely blank. And my knowledge, um, my experience is what writes on the slate of my life. And so as I experience things, my slate begins to fill up and I begin to um, fill in and become who I am. This leads us to also kind of the roots of empiricism. And when we start talking about empiricism, which is, you know, using observation and more scientific methods, that's what's going to lead us into, um, into more modern or more traditional forms of science and psychology. Because right now, this whole nature-nurture debate isn't very scientific, um, but it's getting there. And so we'll talk about that with the history approach to this. Um, it looks like Billy, is that who, yep, Billy has a question here. It says, will these be available for review after the Crowdcast date? And so, um, yes, these are all going to be recorded. And so even if you can't join the live session, um, it would be great to be able to come back maybe even in early May to watch and start preparing for the AP test. These are all recorded and they'll eventually be posted onto the website. And so once you join Fiveable, you'll be able to have access to all of these things um, no matter whenever you want to review them. Good question. All right, so back then to this. Um, so that to me kind of sums up the nature nurture debate that we have going on here. Um, and then the next topic that we move on from nature and nurture are these two ideas of structuralism versus functionalism. And so these are considered probably the earliest roots of what we would call actual psychology. So nature and nurture debate that's been happening for hundreds of years and it's still going on. We still talk about it in psychology, but those early roots aren't super scientific. This structuralism versus functionalism is a little more scientific and it's going to be the kind of early roots then of what we're talking about for psychology. Um, so structuralism is sometimes kind of confusing because it's this kind of vague term, but really what's happening here is psychologists have people sit down and use introspection to report their experiences and their feelings and whatever is happening inside their brains and their minds. And so um, some of the early experiments would be like dropping a ball and having someone react to hearing that ball and talk about what they're feeling or what they see. And so that's the introspection. You're looking inside yourself, talking about those different things. Um, two of the big names that you have to remember then that go with this are Wundt and Titchener. Um, and a little trick to help you remember who goes with structuralism. Structuralism starts with an S. Wundt and Titchener start with WT. All of those letters are at the end of the alphabet. So if you get stuck trying to remember who goes with what, just know the S and the W and the T all at the end of the alphabet. That should give you a little hint to help you remember who goes with what. So anyways, the structuralism uh, debate or the structuralism idea that's going on is having people self-report. And so one of the issues with structuralism, why it maybe isn't as good as it could be, is that first of all, it's what the mind or your consciousness were. Because as soon as something happens, and then I try to talk about it, it's already in the past. So it's not giving me 
an immediate current snapshot. It's my interpretation of what has already happened. And so that makes structuralism kind of vague, kind of hard to use. Another problem is it really depends on being articulate. If you aren't very verbal, if you don't express yourself well, you might report an experience in an inaccurate way. And so then that structuralist approach isn't very useful anyways because it's not giving a good picture of what's going on inside you. Um, so in response to structuralism, that comes first, structuralism, is this idea of functionalism. And functionalism then is looking at how all those things in our mind actually work to form our consciousness. So how do all of these separate parts come together and form like who I am as a human, as a conscious, sentient being? And um, the names you kind of have to know for this one, this psychology, like I said, this unit is big on names. So I'm going to give you tips to help you remember. Um, James and Darwin. And the same trick applies here. J, James, D, Darwin, and F, functionalism, are all towards the beginning of the alphabet. So those three names all go together towards functionalism. And so if you look at the root of the word functionalism, function, it kind of, it tells us how the mind and consciousness work. And so a good analogy to think of here to remember the difference between structuralism and functionalism is thinking about a car. If I took apart a car engine right now, threw all the pieces out on the floor and had you look at them, unless you were super, super into cars, that's not going to tell you how a car works, right? That's the structuralist approach. It's looking at the carburetor, the, oh gosh, I can't name parts of the car, the carburetor, the, the place where the oil filter goes, the, all the different pieces of the engine and just looking at them all as separate pieces and trying to figure out how a car works it probably wouldn't be a very successful approach. The functionalist approach puts all of those pieces together, looks at them as a whole and says, oh, so that's how the car works. We put all the pieces together. Now we can understand how consciousness or how the mind works. Got another question here. This question is from Dylan. How did the nature side support when siblings and twins were separated and they came became completely different people? That's a really good question. Um, and so that would be an argument today kind of against some of the nature side. And so what we see a lot in psychology today is um, that nature and nurture both matter, basically. In anything that we talk about, it's never or almost never going to be, oh, that's 100% nature or that's 100% nurture. Now we have had the opportunity to do twin studies, like Dylan mentioned, and we see that um, a lot of things are more nurture, um, certain things like our political beliefs, our religious beliefs, um, things like that. Those tend to rely more on the, the nurture side. Some things are more nature, some genetic things, um, some things to do with intelligence have a strong, strong nature side as well. So I would say way back when in the time of like Socrates and Plato, they didn't have, you know, the twin type studies to really look back and um, and think about and say, oh, well, look at this one twin did this and one twin did that. That's why now when we have the scientific method, these things have become more clear to us as psychologists. Um, I hope that makes sense. I kind of rambled for a second there. Um, I see a couple other questions. Um, how long is this live video? Um, typically, we're going to go about 30 to 60 minutes. It kind of depends on how many questions you guys ask and then how much review we do at the end. So um, today's video, I'm guessing, will be about another 20 or so minutes based on how we're, we're moving so far. Rosemary, I'm going to get to your question in a second. So we'll just kind of keep trucking along here with the functionalism stuff. So. Um, we've looked at structuralism and we looked at functionalism. And then the key here then is that you need to be able to tell the difference between the two. And so going back to that car metaphor, or we could also think about a puzzle metaphor, the main difference between structuralism and functionalism is that structuralism is trying to figure out the individual pieces like of a puzzle. And functionalism is taking those pieces and actually putting them together to see how they work together and make that big picture for us. 
Um, and then Rosemary's question, um, we're going to jump to right here as we start talking about some of the other approaches in psychology. Um, so basically, the downfall then, or the um, flaws to functionalism, that's Rosemary's question. What are the flaws to functionalism? Are kind of responded to here by the behaviorists and by the humanists. The behaviorists would say that basically functionalism is still too vague. It doesn't give us a good enough picture of what's happening because it's still what's happening in your head and I can't go into your head and actually know what your consciousness is. And so after functionalism comes behaviorists and this is in the 1920s and what behaviorists do is basically try to find a more concrete method to think about human behavior, behaviorist behavior. And so they focus completely on observable outward behavior because that's more concrete. I can look at you as a trained psychologist and see what you're doing and make observations about that versus trying to get into your consciousness, into your mind and figure it out. So um, Rosemary, to answer your question, that is one of the criticism, criticisms of functionalism is that it's not concrete enough, basically. And so the behaviorists are a response to those, um, you're welcome, <laughs> the behaviorists are a response to those to that approach. The big names you have to know here are Watson and Skinner. Um, I don't have a trick to remember those two, sorry. But we will have a whole unit about learning and behaviorism and you'll learn all about Watson, all about Skinner. So I wouldn't stress about it too much. This is just kind of the overview of how they came about. And so after the behaviorists and their observable approach to psychology, in the 1960s we see another approach created and that's the humanist approach and the humanist approach is basically kind of touchy-feely lovey-dovey sort of approach to psychology because um, they felt that the behaviorists kind of treated humans almost as like robots and they just um, interacted with things in their environment without emotion without feeling and so the humanists like to focus on how our current environment inhibits or helps us grow and so this is a really nurture approach to psychology, kind of less nature, more nurture. And it's all about human potential and growth. And so maybe you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm going to highlight that later on. But it's all about saying that eventually, you know, my goal is to be the best person I can be. So if you think about a pyramid, the very tippy top of that pyramid is like my self-actualization, being the best I can be. So this approach to psychology, I think, is really positive and really, really nice. It focuses that we can all be the best person that we can be. And then the two names that go with this approach are Maslow and Rogers. And again, I wouldn't stress too much right now about them. You know, a question might pop up on the test about them, but you'll learn a lot more about them as we progress through the unit. Um, a couple other things I want to talk about then. Basically, what is psychology then, right? This is this class that we're taking. And so we look at the functionalist approach, which is in kind of an, a more outdated method now. We have more scientific methods of dealing with psychology. But psychology is the science of behavior and mental processes. And so We've combined both the behaviorist approach, the humanistic approach, the functionalist, all of these different approaches to kind of come up with this broad definition that psychology is the science or the study of both the outward behavior and the inward mental processes. And I see Anna, if you look over in the chat, has a good way to remember Rogers for humanist. Mr. Rogers was a really positive kids show host and humanism is really positive. So I think that's a really great way to remember that. So thank you, Anna. That is wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, and so I just want to highlight then the different perspectives that your teachers are probably talking about right now. And we've touched on some of them, the behavioristic factors, um, the humanistic factors. So there's seven kind of main perspectives right now in psychology. I'm not going to go over each one specifically today. Um, there is a video that's going to be posted to our YouTube channel later that actually shows you a mnemonic device for how to remember each of these perspectives. So if you want to check that out, if you need help with that, that would be a great idea. Um, but the reason I'm just showing you this right now is to basically highlight that there's not just one way to think about psychology. Um, you could study psychology in a lot of different ways, and a lot of different people do, and that doesn't make it right 
or wrong, but we just have to learn about all of them to really understand psychology as a whole. And so the best approach then to take when studying psychology is a biopsychosocial approach. And this is something I stress every year with my students a lot. And basically the biopsychosocial approach says, well, I know it's not just nature and I know it's not just nurture. I know there's lots of factors at play when I'm talking about any sort of human behavior or motivation. And so it takes those multiple factors and looks at any sort of behavior in a variety of ways. And so instead of it has to be just biological or it has to be just behavior, it looks at it as a complementary thing. And so if we talked about, let's say depression really briefly, um, depression and the causes of depression. A biological psych psychologist might say, well, yeah, there's clearly you know, things to do with different levels of neurotransmitters and hormones in the body that can lead to people experiencing depression. However, we also know that social factors or external factors in our environment like stress, um, that's usually one of the causes, like stress and things like that could also play a role in depression. So one of those factors by itself might not explain the depression, but if we look at all of those factors together, it could explain why someone experiences depression. And so using a biopsychosocial approach is really probably the best way to approach most problems in psychology because it looks at more than just more than just one facet of the problem. Um, so usually uh, the thing to remember is that even though you do a bio unit or you do a cognition unit, yes, we're highlighting those specific aspects, but it's always important to come back to this approach and remember that it's not mutually exclusive. These things complement each other and go together. <clears throat> All right, so that's kind of my overview for the history and approaches part. Like I said, it's kind of a short unit. Some of these other units will have a lot more in-depth stuff to talk about, but I did want to highlight then right away three response questions. In the chat right now, if you guys want to or feel comfortable, how many of you have um, already worked on free response questions or are starting to work on them? You can just kind of say yes or we've started, and I'll kind of start talking about what they are here. So um, an FRQ or a free response question is um, basically like a short prompt and a short response. I don't want to say it's an essay because I don't want you to think about it like an essay. Oh, someone has one tomorrow. Good luck. <laughs> um, and so a free response question ends up counting for one third of your AP exam grade. And so you'd say, well, hmm, one third doesn't seem like, you know, obviously as much or a majority but they're super important. They really um, are what can boost your score. You know, on the multiple choice section, a lot of times you can earn enough to get a three or a four, but that FRQ, that response writing is really what boosts you up into that five territory. And so I really want to stress that this year and really start working on it and start practicing it um, from the get go, just so that you feel comfortable with it. So the setup for the free response question on the AP test is you get 50 minutes, and they give you two prompts. And there's no penalty for like writing wrong information, and so you should just kind of give it a go and try your best. And it is, um, it is kind of a time crunch because there's usually about 16 vocab words that go along with the prompts. So you have a lot of terms to work with within the prompts. And then the scoring for the FRQs is based on your ability to apply the terms to the situation. So um, knowing the definition is not going to be sufficient to give you points on an FRQ, you really have to know the term and be able to give like a real world application or a prompt application to the question. And so there's a specific style of writing that goes along with this. And so chug sodas is the uh, kind of acronym or the mnemonic device that I use. And so you might want to jot this down or take a picture, but the first things have to do specifically with just your overall approach. Be concise. This is not a big flowery essay. Extra information isn't going to score you points here. The, the people who read and grade these are looking for really specific points. And so adding in a lot of extra information isn't probably going to help you a whole lot here. Handwriting is going to be very important um, just because if they can't read it, they can't grade it. 
uh, and you should use a pen because pen smudges less than pencil typically and is more permanent. You should always, always, always underline the word, whatever the vocab word is that you're using. You want to draw the person's attention to what you're talking about. So imagine this is how they grade them. Um, one of my one of the teachers I work with, she grades FRQs. They sit in a room all day grading hundreds of essays. And so you want to do everything in your power to make sure that they don't make a mistake because they're human. And so underlining the words that you're talking about draws their attention to it and makes sure that they don't miss that information. So you want to help them out to make sure you get the points you deserve. The G in chug stands for getting rid of extra stuff. You do not write an introduction. You do not write a conclusion. When my students write it, I don't even read it. I put a big X through it and ignore it. Um, it's just a waste of your time, and you don't have a lot of it when you're writing this. So make sure that you are using the time to the best of your abilities. Um, I have a question about can we highlight? Um, I guess I'm not, I don't think they would penalize you for having a highlighter. Um, you can bring writing utensils in, so if you wanted to, I think that would be acceptable. I guess I've never heard of someone doing that, but I mean, underlining is typically the way that I would say to do that, but I don't think you're going to get penalized for doing that because, you know, people write in pen or pencil or whatever. So um, I would stick with the underlining, but if you feel comfortable doing that, I don't think it would be a penalty. Um, so on to the soda part then when you're answering the question, you want to leave space. So like I said, there's about 16 words or terms that you're going to be using in the prompt. And so you want to put a space between each one. That way, again, if I'm grading hundreds of essays in one day, I don't accidentally miss what one of your words. So I would always just leave one line of space between, you know, term one and term two. Leave a blank where you're talking about that. You should also always go in order when you're talking about these questions. Um, again, if I'm grading these essays and then you've got the first word last, the middle word first, and they're all like scrambled up into a big essay, I'm going to miss your information. So even if you're not sure about something, what I would do is go point one. Oh gosh, I don't even know what word one means at all. I would skip three or four lines and then start with point two. Um, just leave yourself some space so you can go back to it. But I would never go out of order because that makes the reader's job a lot harder. Um, just pausing again here to answer a question. Anna's asking, will there be practice FRQs through Fiveable or live reviews? Yes. Um, I plan on every other session posting either multiple choice questions or FRQ questions and then giving you guys a chance to start to write and respond to them. So today I actually do have a prompt. We're going to just do a really short one. I'm not going to make you guys respond today just because it's our first day. Um, but um we will have multiple chances to practice these throughout the year good question um and then tanya asks since there's no intro will this be bullet style or one huge paragraph so i would not do bullet points and i would just leave a space between each term so let's say on the frq you have the term nature and the term nurture you would start by talking about nature write that paragraph all about nature leave a space and then write your next paragraph all about nurture. So the spacing is how you kind of denote that you're starting a new idea, if that makes sense. All right, and so then specifically, this is all just kind of background stuff that we suggest you do, and we'll go over this again and again. But what you're actually writing then is you're defining and applying. So let's go back to that idea. If the term is nature, you would define nature. And I would literally start by saying, Nature is the idea in psychology that our genetics predetermine who we are. That's my definition. And that's really all you have to write for the defined part. And then I would immediately continue with, this means that, and then you have to apply it to whatever the prompt is asking you about. So you always want to define and apply the term to the scenario. The application is really what scores you the points. But having a strong definition can um, support showing that I know what I'm talking about and give you a better chance of earning those points. And then the S, um, the last S in soda,
stands for synonyms. You don't want to use the word nature in your definition of nature. It, it doesn't show that you actually know what the word means. So try to find synonyms to kind of talk around those points, if that makes sense. All right, so I have a little practice prompt. It's pretty short and pretty vague because we are in, like I said, the intro unit. We haven't covered a lot of material yet. Um, but my practice prompt says, the Grinch who stole Christmas is all around Grinchy. His number one goal in life is to ruin the holiday season for all the who's in Whoville, and we really aren't sure why. Act as a psychologist from each perspective below and offer a possible explanation for why the Grinch acts the way he does. And so in the intro unit, you've read, um, if you haven't started it yet, hopefully, I think most of you said you had, you've read about these three perspectives. And that's now what I need to respond to in the prompt. So following my chug sodas technique, I would start by talking about the psychodynamic perspective. And the psychodynamic perspective um, definition is as follows. The psychodynamic perspective believes that unconscious conflicts from our past are driving current motivation and behavior. So there I was very concise. I underlined the word psychodynamic perspective. So I look at that. I know right away what I'm talking about. I didn't write any sort of flowery introduction. I got right into the point. I defined it. And now I need to apply the term. So this is usually where it can be tricky. Sometimes you have to make up or add information in. So I have to guess now or apply why the Grinch is so Grinchy based on the psychodynamic perspective. And so my explanation says that perhaps when the Grinch was a toddler, the Grinch's father walked out on the family on Christmas Eve. While, that, while he does not specifically remember that event, those negative feelings are driving his current attitude toward the Who's and their Christmas celebration. So I'm showing that there's some sort of unconscious memory that's driving his negative behavior. I'm applying that idea of the psychodynamic perspective to the situation that's written about. And that's the key there. If you're bringing in new information, which is okay, you still have to make sure it links to the prompt. So I have to make sure I'm explaining why this information proves that the Grinch is Grinchy. Otherwise, um, you won't score the points if you don't relate it back to the prompt. All right, questions. I'm gonna come to both of those questions that you guys just posted, um, Alex and Kevin at the end here, okay? The next term then in my prompt was the behavioral perspective. And so we did talk a little bit about the behavioral perspective. It had to do with like observable behavior, watching and learning from others. So again, I start with the behavioral perspective believes that human action is derived from learned responses and consequences. I got straight to the point. I underlined my term. I defined it. I didn't do any extra information. I was nice and concise. And then now the application. Perhaps as a child, every time the Grinch asked for a Christmas present, his mother put soap in his mouth. He has learned to associate the holiday season with the nasty taste of soap. Therefore, he dislikes everything to do with Christmas. So it was an observable behavior, the soap in the mouth, that made him now have negative feelings towards Christmas, things like that. Is this, um, hopefully this is making sense. Like I said, it's kind of hard to do an FRQ um, super in-depth on the first day because we haven't covered a ton of terms, but we'll keep practicing it. And right now, I think the big takeaway we need is the chug sodas idea. So to answer the two questions we have here, um, Alex asked, is there a difference between biological perspective and biological psychology? No, I use those pretty interchangeably. The perspective is just the way of like thinking about it, I guess. And biological psychology would be like the actual like field of study. So I would I don't really see much of a difference there in like how you would think or talk about either one of those things. Um, and then Kevin asked, is the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic the same thing? That is a good question and that is confusing, but no, they are not identical. Um, one stems from the other. And so when you get into the psychodynamic unit, you'll learn about Freud and how his approach grew into that perspective. So no, they're not identical, but they're very similar. And you'll have a whole unit later on 
where you learn about them and the kind of specific differences. Basically, one is older and one is newer. Good question. Um, and then we have another question about specifically the FRQs here. Um, I know this is a different case, but does it matter how crazy our explanation is as long as it actually applies to the perspective? I mean, I would keep it PG, obviously, when you're talking about something, I wouldn't like come up with some crazy or inappropriate story. Um, but as long as it is feasible in regards to what you're talking about, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter as long as it relates to the prompt that like your point is clear and you've related the information. The other thing I would say is that a lot of times in the prompt, they're going to give you information to work with. So the prompt might be a little bit longer. I could have said in the prompt, you know, the Grinch, I could have said the stuff about the Grinch's dad leaving his family for Christmas. And then that would be where you pull that information in to show your understanding of the perspective. So sometimes you'll actually have to create the information. You can be a little silly or a little funny um, with that information. That's totally fine. Um, but otherwise, the information is sometimes also provided to you as well, if that makes sense. All right. And so then just look in here. I think we had one other perspective. Yeah, the social cognitive perspective. This is the last one I'm going to talk about. So if you have any last minute questions that you're kind of thinking about, you might want to get them in now because this will be the last kind of part of what I'm talking about for today before I kick it over to Amanda to talk to you guys for a second about Fiveable as well. So the third bullet point here was the social cognitive perspective. And so again, I start by defining it right away. The social cognitive perspective of psychology states that a person's actions are influenced by their peers, environment, community, and more. Again, definition, concise, I've underlined, no extra info. I'm gonna keep drilling that into you guys this year because that's really important. Perhaps the Grinch grew up in a strict religious sect that does not approve of Christmas. The Grinch was influenced by his religious elders to despise and even try to ruin all things related to the holiday. So that would be then explaining why the social cognitive perspective says that the Grinch doesn't like Christmas and the Who's in Whoville. Um, looks like we have one other question here. How often will Fiveable have these live casts? Um, we are doing them weekly. So I will be here every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. unless I have some sort of other thing going on, but we'd let you know ahead of time and we would reschedule it. But every, every Tuesday I'll be going over some specific topic in psychology, kind of like we did today, and also doing a little bit of review. Good question. I think that's it that I'm going to say today. So I'm just really um, happy you guys were all here, and hopefully I will see you guys next time. All right. Good. Bye, guys.